set mine to record <clears throat> like that. Yes. Then we can talk about cheese graters. We can. Before we start we recording. Can be, because, you see, you know, there are, there are on occasion times in yes. one's life when one really needs to discuss cheese graters. But in you this know, case... I think it's time. Mm. Well, in this mm. case, it's in the context of patterns of holes. Okay. And a phobia. Of patterns of holes. People, some people per, uh, profess to have of patterns of holes in things. Okay. <clears throat> and it's not actually a phobia. It's, um, it's a, 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 an evolved revulsion response. Okay. Obviously served some purpose way back when. Uh, and it's sort of stayed with us, apparently. I don't get it very much, except... Except, except, when I make myself one of these pre-packed, freeze-dried, um, powder, uh, floofy coffees. You know, we had this discussion back in episode something about coffee should not come from a packet. I remember. It's wrong, and it gets lumps in it, and it's not. It good gets coffee. lumps in it, but, he, but the th this is the thing. You see, with these floofy ones. This is like an Irish latte with like lots of foam on it, and the foam's got bubbles in it. Right. And the bubbles are kind of making me go like. Ugh. I should expect so. It's come out of a packet. I, I'm just saying, you know, this Woman, is, you this is not you floof good it coffee. You floof it up. It smells nice. Yeah, but pack it. It's just the bubbles, and it's like a, it's like the pattern of, of they look like spiders' eyes, and they just kind of make me go. Ugh. Like that a bit. Well, they will do if you think you've got a mug full of spider's eyes. They're all peering at me. They're going to be kind of like pomegranate and seeds when you eat them. Oh, oh no. <laughs> They're all peering at me. They're all glittering. I can't, I can't drink my coffee. <laughs> it's never stopped you before. I've never thought about, <laughs> about it as spider's eyes before. It's just... <laughs> I'm going to have to try and drink this without looking at it. I can get you a straw. I, I'm fine. I don't think you can drink coffee with a straw anyway, can you? Yeah, you can. Isn't it like a rule? Get metal ones from, like, your your favourite online retailer. Can you? Yeah, other online retailers are available. Your favourite onli online retailer dot co dot uk? Well, possibly. Depends where you are in the world, really. Well, yes, obviously. I'm not saying everybody should go to co uk. I'm saying, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Metal straws. And spider's eyes in your coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to drink the spider's eye part of your coffee. But... Which is, to be fair, a conversation that only a pagan household would have. Well, this is probably <laughs> true. <laughs> you see, eyes of newt I could have dealt with. Yeah, I know. They're like grapes. My wife, she's drinking coffee. 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 Cardo. Cardo. Now you're going to have to explain that one to no, me. No, no. <laughs> Much more fun if I don't. You're going to start going, what is going you're on? You're going to struggle to find a reference for your notes on that one. Yeah, I am actually. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best with it. It'll be okay. fine. All right, carry on. It'll be fine. Lovely listeners, the last time we had a chat, we were talking about the ethics and practicalities of using runes in an oracular way. We were. We were. Um, what you might have realised on coming to the end of that episode is that when we originally recorded the discussion, it ended up at quite a long time. So we've cut it into two episodes, this being the second half. Because we're cheats like that. We are not cheats. We're just, you know... Actually, no, it's bargain. Tradition. Two episodes for the price of one. Two episodes for the price of one. 
and also tradition that our podcasts are 30 ish minutes, yes. give or take a minute or two. Indeed, indeed. We'd like to welcome you back. We'll do some introductions. I'm Suzanne Martin. I'm a UK ambassador for an organisation called TAC, which is the Asatro community. Uh, and uh, you're also a heathen. Yes. Anything else? I mean, we could, we could, you know, throw in no, a few. No, that's, that's, but, you know, I'm just yeah. leaving with a nice bit of introduction yeah. to start with, and then you okay. do your thing, and then we'll in see that, where it goes from there. And... In that case, because Suzanne said everything she wants to say, um, I'm Kate, and I'm, uh, I, my claim to fame is I'm married to Suzanne, and that's basically it. <laughs> And she finds it difficult to get me out of the kitchen because this is where the food is. <laughs> so when she's recording, I'm tending to sit here as well. Okay. <laughs> Just saying. Lovely listeners, may I introduce Kate, who is the coffee-powered druid this evening, especially coffee-powered. Very, very coffee-powered. I've had noodles too. And noodle-powered. A noodle-powered druid. Noodle-powered druid. Noodle powered druid, but mostly the coffee powered druid. So let's see what we got up to in the discussions from last time. The other thing I find very, very important is if you're going to go do an event and read rooms for people at an event, when you first arrive, find out where the loo is. Oh, heavens, yes. You might not have a lot of time between individuals coming to you for readings to go find the loo, to go figure out where the loo is. Find it before you start. <laughs> Always good advice. I mean, to be Always honest, to be honest, I'd advice. say any time you go to a new place, find out where the loo is. It's just, yeah, you know. it's kind of practical. Yeah. The other one would be have a bottle of water with you mm-hmm. because you might not get a chance to get a drink to stand up and go to a bar or to get catch somebody's eye like one of the steward's eyes and get them to bring you one yeah have one with you not too much because you'll need to go to the loo it's not a good thing to be thinking of in the middle of somebody's reading you see how it all starts to interlink (laughs) yeah (laughs) the other thing i found very very important for me is to have a very discreet box of tissues this is for the emotion yes when i've read for people in the past I've looked them dead in the eye and I've said something and I've, you know, thinking I know what I've got to say here. And they've got very, very upset. So to preserve their dignity as a human being, have a box of tissues on hand. (laughs) Yeah. You will need a box of tissues on hand. If you are going to read for other people, decide how long each reading will take. Figure out your preferred spread. Figure out how long you need to talk about it. Factor in some discussion time afterwards. Wait, sorry, your your preferred spread? Yes, Marmite. Jam. Awesome. Mm, And now I want Marmite. (laughs) (laughs) No, the spread is a word that you use for the set pattern. Like if you have tarot cards or if you have runes. You can cast them in a set pattern. You can lay them out in a set pattern upside down. Okay. Some people may choose to take their runes and just drop them from a low height because you don't want the little soldiers bouncing off under the sofa (laughs) because this is what they'll do if you give them half a chance. So you drop them and you might then choose to pick three or you might have a piece of cloth with a design paint uh, sewn onto it, painted onto it. And you'll drop them and the ones inside a certain circle you'll read a certain way and the ones outside it you read another way. Okay, so the basically... Ones touching each other, you'll, you'll have a technique for how you actually... Which are the ones you're paying attention to. Which ones yeah. you pay attention to. So your spread is a word that I use for the positioning of the runes when I would take them out and put them face down or my client will take them out and put them face down. Mm. That pattern that they go in when I'm reading for somebody else, it's always the same pattern okay. that I use, the same spread. So some people will use a three rune spread. So you'll have one rune for the past, one rune for the now, and one rune for the future. Okay. Some people will use a five. Some people use a six and nine. Yeah. There are countless numbers of patterns, and it's finding one that suits you. Okay. Obviously not one that uses over half your runes because that's going to be a very very big pattern to talk somebody through 
And presumably they'll all, they'll all interact anyway. They all interact. So the more rooms you draw, the more complex your relationships between the rooms, the more complex the answer is that you're giving. Mm. The more time that you will have to take, the longer that the reading will occur. And if you are going to an event, there is a guarantee that it will run over. Yeah. Especially if you have something like you're going to a, a, a psychic night, a psychic event, reading night, and you're there as one of the readers, the chances are that your clients are having two or three separate sessions with different people. If one client with one reader runs over by five minutes, it will knock everything out by about half an hour by the end of the night. Nice. Yeah. So factor in the fact that you will run late. This is why my doctor's appointments are always half an hour late. This is why your doctor's appointments are always half an hour late, because <clears throat> you get a knock-on effect. Hmm. Somebody, you know, you have a seven-minute appointment, somebody takes eight minutes, the next person takes nine minutes, and suddenly you're... I wouldn't mind, but it was nine o'clock in the morning. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, <clears throat> with your spread, that ties into how long you want to spend with each client. What you've got to factor into how long you spend with each client mm -hmm. is what spread you want to use, what kind of discussion time you want afterwards, what kind of spiel you want when they sit down. Okay. The likelihood is they've never had their rooms read before. Mm. They don't know what they are, they don't know who you are, and you don't know who you, how you operate. So you can't just go, right, here's the rooms, pick them out, let's talk about them, because they'll go, Ugh! Yeah. So you need to settle them down first. What happens... Ethically, when somebody turns a rune over and you get no instinct of what to say, mm. what do you tell them? You know, how do you handle that? For me, I put a line or two in my opening two-minute spiel, which has got to be factored into the length of time that you yeah, take yeah. per reading. And I will say, you know, we're going to choose the runes, turn them over one by one, and if I don't get anything from a rune, I will tell you. Mm. It might be that it's waiting for another room to be turned over before that piece will click into place. Yeah. It might be that I get a very strong impression from one <clears throat> and a uh, slightly less focused impression from another. Mm. And so that they're prepped, they're, they're aware that that might happen. Yeah. I've had readings where I've not been able to read. Okay. I've had a client sit and I have not had anything I can tell them. My dad. Mm. I don't know whether I ought to broadcast this on Frithcast, but... You could do that. My dad, yes. um, in his younger days, was uh, a palmist. Yes, he was. I remember. And I remember uh, him telling me the story. If he'd been out at some some event uh, similar to what you were describing, and this um, this lady came up to him, and he said she was quite an, an, older, an old, older than him at the time. And... Um, and she came up and said, oh, would you read my palm? And, and he said, yes, of course. And sat her down and, 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 and looked at her hand. Mm. And he couldn't get anything from it at all. Mm. And bearing in mind, he's, he's read countless books and, you know, yeah. countless and techniques. And, things. and the, the, hand, the, the lines were there. Yeah. He says, but he just couldn't read anything yeah. from them at all. And um, he s sat there for... For a couple of minutes, just just squinting and trying to just get something, anything that he mm. could made sense to tell her, and in the end he said, "I'm sorry, I can't seem to get anything from your hand. I, I don't know why." And she just smiled at him and said, "No, nobody can." Oh and my, my good and, grief! And my sister's the same. <sighs> but thank you for your time. And she walked away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the moral of this story, lovely listeners, is. Don't poke the, the smiling old man with the broom. No. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> yes. no, is that sometimes it doesn't matter how experienced you are as a reader, as an oracle, as somebody who divines. There will be days, there will be clients where it just doesn't connect. No. And that's okay. In fact, I would expect it. Mm. Because if you go into every reading expecting that you're going to get this wonderful connection and this spiel when it doesn't happen you're going to be knocked for six mm. you've you're got going to be, be ready you've got to be ready for the fact that you're going to get this either a huge rush of incredibly strong feelings emotions words images pictures smells whatever it is you get mm. or you just get the equivalent of a flat line static and yeah. you think 
Why? Why? What What was that all about? What's going on? Carry a wave, but nothing else. Carry a wave, but nothing else. And you know it's switched on, it's just not actually connecting. And that's okay. It's okay for it to do that. Because it might be that they're not ready to hear something. Yeah. It might be that they're not in the place to hear what you've got to say. And the runes have just gone, not yet. It might be that you're not the person that's supposed to be... Yeah, passing it on to them. Exactly. Yeah. For me, that's part of the process is not freaking out when it doesn't yeah. connect like yeah. it usually does. When you get when you start working with them and you start getting that those very, very strong sensations, there will be times when you just get nothing. Mm. You get static, you get flat line, you get a jumble unfocused mess of something and you think what on earth is that yeah and that's okay it's meant to happen in fact it's it's deliberately meant to happen it's the cipher text yes they haven't handed you the key yet they have not <laughs> and the same goes when i sit down with a client i will say things like you know we'll turn the rooms over one by one in fact generally i ask them to turn the rooms over because the minute they sit down with me i don't touch the rooms at all mm. And I will say, you know, you'll turn them over. You'll pick. You'll turn them over in the order that you want. I will tell you what comes through. Mm. If there is nothing, I will tell you I'm getting nothing. But the likelihood is when you when you get to a point, you'll start getting images, mm. words. And you'll look at your client and you'll think, your brain will kind of go, can I say that? Am I supposed to say that? <laughs> Am I really supposed to say that? Because that's kind of, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. It's a bit harsh. Am I, you know, clearly this, you know, this person's not looking very happy. If I tell them this, are they really not going to be very, very happy with me? And that's another ethical sort yeah. of understanding you... of, of what you've got to do in a certain situation. What decision do you make? Are you just a conduit for the information that's coming to you and you have no choice but to pass it on verbatim, mm. or are you expected to moderate it to some extent? And if you do, is that ethical? Yeah. Is it ethical to moderate it? Is it ethical not to moderate it? Well, I suppose, I mean, the How old, do you judge I, that balance? I suppose the classic the classic issue is if... I mean, I, I know that certainly in tarot, what a lot of the symbolism that relates to death and so on mm. has other meanings yes um but i mean that's it's always the, the the sort of classic dilemma isn't it if you if you're reading cards or reading runes or reading something you'll get information from somewhere yes and it comes through and says something dreadful is about to happen to this person or somebody that they care for or, yeah or and have you, you look and you think can i tell that person mm. should i tell that person have i got a duty to tell that person am i the one that's got to warn them it's got to happen yeah so as a reader, as a diviner, as an oracle, you have to make that ethical decision. Mm. And there is no legal overseeing body to tell you you've done it right. No. But again, UK specific, you know, let's not forget that the, 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 the other edge of the sword of telling everybody that it's for entertainment purposes in order to mm. comply with <clears throat> the regulations means that some people at some stage are going to come to you thinking it's for entertainment purposes. Yes. And you hit them with something like that. Yeah, you look them dead in the eye and you tell them something Yeah, that makes no sense to you as a caster, as a reader, as a diviner, whatever word you want to use for yourself. Mm. It makes no logical sense to you at all. Mm. And you look at that person and you think, my gods, am I supposed to say these words? Mm. And you say those words and that person goes sheep white. Then, yeah, you've said, the, you've said something yeah. that's hit home. In that's why you need your box of tissues. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> because they're just in cases. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, you, you end up with the, the, the difficulty. First of all, everybody has to be, if you're pardon the Christian illusion, everybody has to be singing from the same hymn sheet. They do. <clears throat> Have the same expectations of what so, this yeah, session is going to be. Your beginning blurb, the, the two minute beginning blurb that I use, mm. sets the expectations. What it is, how long it will take, what's expected of that person the things that may or may not be talked about. Yeah. And the expectation at the end is if that person wants to comment on what you've told them, 
do you allow that as a reader or do you just say you know what I don't need to know what this is about mm. you've had your message and, and have a good journey and off you go yeah or do you say to them if you know you do want to comment on what's coming up save it till the end yeah so that it's not influencing the other rooms that I might turn over in the process which is one of the I, I would I may be being a little unfair but it would strike me as uh, a quality of the more shady yes oracle type who yes. is looking for constant feedback from the person yes in order to tailor what they're saying yep um i don't ever want that no i don't it, want it, feedback from the individual that i'm reading for yeah during the reading i'll take it afterwards it, but it's a way to keep but after is sterile different. i suppose yes is to keep a sterile environment and make sure that you're not you know, inadvertently cold reading from them or... or um... Yes, or, you know, your other ethical issue is if you're talking about a certain thing and you're giving them the understanding of one room mm. and they say, oh, yes, that's to do with so-and-so, you'll then, however unconsciously, be thinking about that and missing the potentially subtle connection of the room next door to it yeah. that connects in, in a different way. So I tend to say to somebody, if you'd like to talk about it at the end, you're very welcome to. Mm. You don't have to. There is no expectation on that person to disclose what they think it all relates to. Yeah. They can, you know, I do offer and say, if you want to talk about it, you're welcome to. If you don't, you're welcome to. Mm. I'm not going to get offended if you just go, thank you very much and get up and leave. Yeah. Because I have no right to know. Mm. And you have to kind of deal with that unfinished ending in a way in about two and a half minutes before your next before client comes, comes in and sits down. Yeah. And if you're running late, they're already hovering yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're already waiting to come and sit down and sit with you. So you've got to, as a reader, you've got to be able to shut that last client off and all of their associations and any feelings, images or otherwise yeah. come back to your blank st Blank slate state. I nearly said that wrong. Tabula and rasa. Your tabula rasa. You've got to come back to your centre. Yeah. Your blank state, and be ready to read for the next client who's just sneaking into that warm seat that your last one's just vacating. Going, hi. How does this work? How do we do this? And you've got to be able to switch. Yeah. Like that, and go from one to the other. Yeah. So I've found as I've read for people, especially at events, or I've read for you know, continuously done readings over a period of time, I've found that being able to not necessarily shut one client off, but being able to let go of them yeah, and get ready for your next one and focus on them, that's a very useful skill. Mm. You have to get used to the idea of not knowing. You don't, you don't get closure. Ironically, <clears throat> as the reader, as the diviner, as the oracle, as the room person, yeah, you don't get closure. You don't get to know. You might never get to know. You know, for the people that you read for, they might just go, all right, OK, and stand up and walk off and give you no feedback, give you no understanding of what it is you've just read, whatever complex issues have just come up in this reading, whatever incredibly strong feelings you've had. Yeah. They might just go, thanks, and walk off. And you think, but what do I do with all of this? I've got it all bagged up behind my eyeballs and but I need to move it out of the way. But it's not yours. It's not yours. Mm. It's not yours. And part of the skill is being able to put it down. Yeah. And take a big deep breath. Settle in and get ready for the next person who's probably by this point had a glass of wine and he's ready to come and see what all their mates have been chattering about. <laughs> so you've got a lot of ethics to consider if mm. you are going to start reading for people. It gets even more challenging when that person sits down in front of you and goes, go on then, because I don't believe this works. Well, that goes one of two ways. <laughs> <laughs> one of them, it ends up with them going sheet white. Yeah. <laughs> Because you sit there and you hold firm to your skills and you know you can do it. Because when they sit down and say, I don't believe you, yeah. you get a seed of doubt. Mm. And it's whether you as a reader or an oracle 
or a diviner choose to let that in that moment choose to let that seed take root and you start doubting your own skills mm. because it's your confidence and you you have faith that these things work yeah i know that my runes work mm. and i also know that if a skeptic sits down with me that's where the fun really begins <laughs> because I've had skeptics sit down with me and I've read for them and it's been very difficult because they've been very closed. Oh. They've not given me a lot to work with. I'm not getting a lot of strong images. I'm not getting strong feelings. I'm not getting strong words because they're not, they may not be in a place ready to hear it. Yeah. They're being afraid. And this they're is not... being defensive. They're being, <clears throat> this is not me reading them as an individual. I was going to say, this reading is... the runes that they've picked out. We, we... We obviously <clears throat> try to discourage people from, feet, as we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago, you obviously try to discourage people from, from physically or, or verbally feeding back to you. Yes. Um, but we're not talking about when a... When a, a I, I'm always a bit cautious about the term sceptic because I consider myself quite sceptical. Yes. Uh, just... Uh, well, let's just say very assertive sceptic. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> Um, bordering on aggression <laughs> is, is about where I'm I mean thinking. there are there are obviously things that you know I'm a I'm a I'm a I consider myself a religious person I believe in the gods uh, different set but albeit you know all yeah still there bro broadly broadly still similar good. concept still good. and yeah I mean there were, there, were, there are people who 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 would call themselves skeptics who would laugh and jeer at the, the fact that I believe some of these ridiculous things uh, as they would see it. But I am still quite sceptical. You know, there yes. are lots of things. Well, Healthy sceptical is, is fine. Somebody makes a claim. My first thought is, okay, how do we corroborate this? I did, my first thought isn't necessarily how do I debunk this. No. You know, it's what I'm, evidence have we got to back this up? I'm, I'm maybe talking about the individuals who are looking immediately to go to the debunk phase of the yeah. argument. And, and not stopping at the let's consider this phase even to pass go and collect $200. They're just going straight to... I don't believe you. Yeah. And when you we're taking money off these horror, you know, these emotional, vulnerable people and you are scamming them. And yeah. I'm thinking, well, you could look at it that way. Yeah. I prefer not to look at it that way. I prefer to look at it as offering a service that people can access if they want to. Mm. It's one of the reasons that charging money for me is very much case by case basis. Yeah. Um, but with a skeptic, when they sit down and they draw the runes, they might be quite angry about it. You mm. might feel it radiating off them yeah. in these huge, big waves of solid brick wall. That it's going to... My gods. It's going to fog things. Fog. Mm. Yeah, pea super. Fog them right up. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> right up. You as a reader have a choice, an ethical choice. You can choose whether you read for that person or not. Mm. You don't have to. It's not an absolute requirement of you to do that. Yeah. You can choose. If you do not feel safe, don't. If you're feeling that they are being aggressive, don't. If they are being abusive, don't. If they're very, very angry, just come away. Mm. You know, I've dealt with the ones, the sceptics that have gone straight to the debunk stage. Yeah. And as I said, it, it works one of two ways. And I've sat down with some of them and it can feel like you're getting images or your usual way of whatever method it is that you receive your communications, whether it's images, whether it's words, whether it's hearing things, whether it's sense whatever it is, or whether it's a combination of those things, it's like you're looking at them through a fog mm. and you're not forming as clear a connection. Alternatively, you can form an incredibly strong connection and you sit there with absolute faith and total confidence and you tell them what is in their reading mm. and they go sheep by you. <laughs> and then they sit there for a minute or two and they mutter a bit and then they kind of quietly sidle off mm -hmm. somewhere. And you know then that human being that you have just formed an empathic connection with, even though they were angry, even though they were scared, mm. 
you've just told them something of huge value mm. and they're going to be sat thinking about that for quite a few days. You might decide as a reader that you want to provide a record sheet for your client. As you read for them, you make notes of what you're saying. Okay. You can do. Mm. I tend not to because then I'm concentrating on what I'm writing and not what I'm saying. Yeah. So for me, that method doesn't work as effectively as just saying. Mm. I have faith that what I say is exactly what they need to hear. Mm. At that precise moment, those are the words I need to use. Yeah. Whatever those words happen to be, whatever those images happen to be, whatever those feelings happen to be. And again, they may mean nothing to you whatsoever. They generally don't mean anything to me whatsoever. Mm. <laughs> they don't have the same values. Yeah. But you can often tell by the expression on people's faces mm. that something has hit home. Something went click. Something went, you need to listen to this. Mm. This is important for you right now. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. If it doesn't, they might it choose doesn't. not to donate anything, and that's fine. Yeah, that is not your ethical duty as a reader, as a diviner, as an oracle, mm. as a rune caster, whatever phrase it is that you want to use, because there are quite a few. Mm. Your understanding is to give that that reading to the best of your ability. Yeah. And whether they understand it or not is beyond your ability. <laughs> <laughs> so there are quite a few things to get your head into. Yeah, it's complex. It's complex and the, it's worth keeping in mind that there are ethics mm. involved. And if nothing else, you're treating the human being sat opposite you with dignity, and with respect and with empathy. Mm. And, you know, be prepared things for things like needing your box of tissues. Yes. <laughs> Be prepared for somebody to have a sudden outburst of anger because you've just hit a sore point mm. and they have no idea how you know it. Mm. But you've just sat there and read for them mm. and said the words that you're meant to say or describe the images, whatever it is. And they've just looked at you and gone, how did you know that? Yeah. Where does that come from? Who told you that about me? Where, where did you get that information from? You went, you turned the runes over. It sat right there. Yeah. It's in front of me. I can't not tell you what's written there. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, oh yes, everything's wonderful when, you know, there's a period of immense change coming through. Mm. So there's a lot of things to consider. So it's a bit more of a serious episode this time round. Mm. Um, about... But subject matter warrants, I, I, I believe. Yeah, it probably does. Um, there are a lot of things to consider. Hmm. There's probably quite a few more things to consider that I've managed to not touch on, but they generally are things like the circumstance specific. Yeah. If you want to cast for yourself, that's the way I started. Yeah. I started casting for myself and reading for myself. That, to me, is one of the most powerful self-reflective tools I can have. Mm. that is a way of getting to know myself of getting to honestly take those questions and those issues inwards and seeing what comes out and going yeah okay I can work on that I can look at that mm. I can understand that a bit better I can use them to help myself yeah. to start with and then I started reading for other people yeah friends and family first and then complete strangers that I didn't know and I can now I mean I've, I don't know how long I've been casting for as long as I've known you certainly easily oh that puts it about eight years but I'm mm. fairly certain it was a good few years before that <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed listening through the second part of our discussion on ethics and practicalities of using runes in an oracular way. So if you want to find us online, I'm Suzanne Martin. You can find me on Facebook under the name Suzanne Martin, or you can find me on Twitter at Suzanne Tack, which is T-A-C. And if you want me, um, if you can't think of anything better to do with your time, um, your best way of getting to me is through my 
shambolic website at glassrain.net. Uh, it's all good. Yeah. It's whatever floats your boat, really, isn't it? And that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, lovely listeners, thank you for being with us today, and we will talk to you all next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>